Good evening and welcome to the December 7, 2020 Ordinance Review Committee. This meeting and all who participated with us on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. Uh, first up on our agenda is the roll call. Roll call, Laura, please. Sure. Um, Councillor Labarge. Present. Councillor Nash. Uh, here. Councillor Thorpe. Here. Member Peck. Here. And Member Napolitano. Here. Okay, thank you. Next up on our agenda is public comment. Before I go into a big speech, Laura, is there, did you let everyone in? Is there anyone? Everyone, I mean, just everyone's in and I don't see any members of the public. I think it's just us. Okay, so no one's here for public comment and uh, public comment is now closed. If someone decides to come in later, we can ask if they wanna be heard. Um, but right now I'm gonna move on to the approval of minutes of November 17th, 2020. Do I hear a motion? Move to approve. Motion made by Council Labarge, seconded by. Come on, Megan, do it. I'll second, but <laughs> I also, can I, can we have a short discussion? We always have discussion about okay. the, the minutes. Yep, so that's not even, a, that's not a problem. We're just putting it on the floor. So it is oh. open now for discussion. Uh oh, oh come on. <laughs> so I was just reading through it now and um, I was wondering, um, you know, the, I feel like that um, the um, housing notification act um, or, or, or is, um, is so critical and so time sensitive. I, I just wish that we didn't have to wait for an ordinance um, to be drafted. And when we are, you know, <laughs> this country is facing like um, uh, eviction crisis of 30 million people uh, by the end of this year, um, same time that, you know, there's gonna be a COVID spike and, you know, unemployment benefits are ending. And I was wondering if, you know, like if there's some way, if the planning department is already developing these resources, um, is there some way to maybe just disseminate this to people who are under threat of eviction rather than having to create an ordinance in which we have to, you know, which, which we have to require landlords to, to notify people of this. So mm. just, just I, thought, because I, I know that member Napolitano also talked about I mean, canvassing Springfield with this information before. And I just, you know, I, I don't know what the process is for that. If we just send an email to, I would like to uh, defer to uh, Attorney Seawald, if he could, please. Good evening. So um, I think that when uh, member Napolitano was doing that, I don't think he was doing it as a government agent. Um, we just don't, I think we're gonna get to this later when we talk about uh, uh, Councillor Nash's proposal for uh, contacting renters when zone lines are changing, but we just don't have that information. We don't even know who's renting. We don't have any registration for renters. Right. I remember though, like uh, Wayne Fiden saying that there was going to be some kind of a public forum when they do have this ready to, to kind of just educate the community. And so I just, I, I just thought if it, Right. If the resources is already like a near completion. Can we just somehow even putting it on the city website somewhere? But I, yeah, it's, that would be up to the mayor. The mayor's in control of the city website, so the mayor could put some information on the website. That certainly could be done. Um, but you know, it's not, uh, and so we would be providing the information that we were hoping that the landlords would be required to provide. Mm -hmm. Um, at, you know, yeah, at the time I mean, of eviction or the commencement of the eviction process, which is usually a notice to quit. Uh, so, I mean, that's possible, but it would, you know, that's really up to the mayor. And, um, you know, I'm sure if, uh, uh, you know, if he was asked and presented with some information about, you know, rights and remedies with regard to uh, evictions, I might put it on the website, don't know. 
but that would be up to him. Okay, maybe I'll reach out to him then about this. I mean, after I check on the status of, you know, how it's going with the planning department. Thank you. No, thank you. Anyone else, any further discussion? Council Labarge. Yes, um, question on the approval of minutes for November 17th. Now, if you look at the minutes and I wanna thank Laura because those were lengthy, lengthy minutes. We're here, we look at the minutes and what I'm asking is if there should be any kind of changes before our meeting that I think that our council clerk, Laura Ketzler, should have the opportunity to be able to make changes on minutes. We've always done this, and this prevents us here at meetings of Laura rewriting again. When somebody sees that something is not correct or wants something added on, I think this should be done before our meeting when we go to approve the minutes. That's all I'm asking. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bard. Laura? I'm just always happy to accept any changes. If anybody, sometimes I don't have them posted in time for you to review prior to the meeting. And in that case, obviously you can't. But if you do have changes, feel free, please, to email them to me. And then I can incorporate them into the master version, which can then be accepted. So that's just another opportunity if it's easier. Uh, thank you. I'm just referring to. <laughs> The changes I brought up the last meeting. And what I did was I just um, I just emailed Laura afterwards um, with them all typed in. So yeah. Well, you didn't know anyways, but it makes it easier for her. Mm -hmm. then she has to go back and redo them this way by notifying her ahead of time. When you're reading what she has sent us of notifying her of corrections or change of language, it makes it easier for her. She has a lot. <laughs> of writing that she has to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Counselor, uh, sorry, Attorney Seawalt. I, I, uh, of course, I want the usual admonition that if you're gonna send something to Laura, just send it only to Laura, don't, mm -hmm. or to the chair and Laura, no uh, right. emails to the group about this. The other, the other thing is that traditionally, the, the chair, and in this case, the, the assistant would work through what the minutes are. Any additions to what the chair has developed as the minutes, or in this case, Laura has developed in the minutes, would only be inserted if they're accepted by the body. So I think it's important for Laura to be clear in these minutes drafted what was in the originally circulated minutes and what is pre proposed for addition or subtraction. Thank and you. so that the it's not an automatic addition just because one member says, I think we ought to put this in. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Sewell. Laura. And in this particular case, there was, of course, the audio problem. So I knew I had missed and I knew actually what parts of the minutes I'd missed. So I know that the parts that she did fill in were um, parts that I couldn't hear properly. But yeah, I take your point. <laughs> one would question whether those words were actually spoken at the meeting. Well, okay. I mean, it's sort of the tree falling in the woods. Did anybody really hear it? And you know, if it's not audible, is it has was it really stated at the meeting? I'll leave it at that. So you can approve. You can vote not to approve them. <laughs> I think in this given circumstances, if the the committee wanted your what you were. What you were saying, although it was unheard, uh, to be included, that's fine. I mean, I, I'm not going to be a stickler for that, but that there is that question. And maybe it should be indicated this is what, you know, Member Peck said, but unfortunately her audio was, uh, was malfunctioning at the time. No, Laura doesn't need to do that for the version we're looking at right now, because right. in the last meeting, I did verbalize what the changes I wanted, the additions I wanted, right? Yes. Okay. So do we need to vote to approve? Yes, if there's no other, if there's no other suggestions or 
comments from anyone else and I don't see Jeff on my screen. Jeff, you didn't have anything? Nope, I'm good. Okay. Or can we get uh Councillor LaBarge? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Member Peck? Yes. And Member Napolitano? Yes. Now, before I move forward, I, even though I, we closed public comment, I do see a Rye Buckley on the screen. And I would like to ask if, if, if Rye Buckley would like to uh, make a public comment before we move on. No, okay. Is he connected? Mm -hmm. He's on, um, right, Buckley is on right now. The microphone is off the- Make sure I don't have to unmute him. Let me yep, see. Let's make I sure. think he's able to unmute himself because I, whoops, well, I'm unmuting. Huh. And it's still muted. Huh. Huh. I think, no. oh, I just unmuted him if he- Right, Buckley, would you like to be heard? Make a public comment? Moving on to the next item on the list, suggested ordinance changes and not yet referred to the city solicitor. Up first, we have signed ordinance review to comply with Supreme Court decision. I believe that's referring to the Reed versus Town of Gilbert. Correct. Yes, okay. Hmm. And so that chapter 350 zone, yes, Attorney Seawald. Um, I, I, I just want to put this out for the committee. Um, the, both the council president and I are fully aware that this is an ordinance that needs our attention. And uh, we have made several stops and starts. There are some significant policy decisions that need to be made before anything is drafted um, because of the Gilbert decision. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we are working on this, but I'm not sure that this is something that's gonna happen and actually get drafted during this time period that you guys are, are you know, in business. Uh, so we do know that it needs to be done. And um, we, we had a start and then it fell off the off our screen and then it started again before uh, COVID and then it fell off our screen again. But we're well aware that this needs to be dealt with. And it is at my instruction that um, the uh, inspections department does uh, will not be enforcing this other than on public property the way they have. That's why we're doing it that way because we're aware of that. With that, you're welcome to discuss and, and you know, make recommendations for you know, what kind of regular. Lost audio. And I, 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 what I will say is that um, um, if you're thinking about regulations in this area, they have to be related to aesthetics and safety, okay? We can not ever regulate based on what the sign says. So a directional sign is no different than a vote for Trump sign is no different than any other sign. So it's about where they're located, how big they are, whether they flash, whether they change screens, whether all those kinds of things, the aesthetics and safety. Uh, but the content of a sign can never be regulated uh, under an ordinance. With that, that's, uh, and I did speak with, when I saw this on the, uh, on, on the agenda, I did speak with uh, the council president about it briefly. Thank you, Attorney Seawald. Any comments? Councilor LaBarge. I can't, Councilor LaBarge? Yes, thank you, Councilor. Um, Something I thought I just heard attorney Seawald say something to the effect that signs can cannot be regulated or can they be regulated? They okay. can't be re regulated based upon what the sign says. 
only only based uh-huh. on its size, its location, and things like that. We cannot regulate the content of a sign. Okay, gotcha. And so, a, you know, a sign that says "Vote for Trump" is no different than a, a sign that says, you know, uh, you know, visit John's, you know, toy store. Okay. They're all the same. All and right. so we can't regulate political signs differently than we regulate commercial signs. Um, so, which is what we traditionally have done. Right, because I was a little confused with that because political signs, when you're running campaigns, those are regulated. Where they you- cannot be. They, they cannot-, cannot be. Oh. Yeah, that's all changed. Right. Huh. They have to be treated the same way you treat every other sign. Interesting. Thank you, Attorney Seawall. I'm always thinking ahead to the uh, report that we have to produce. Um, and I think it's just, I don't think it would just include the current ordinances or things necessarily that will turn into ordinances, but there are a lot of ideas that that do percolate through our our committee and our time here that I feel would be very relevant, you know, for for our local policymakers. So, um, yeah, I I would definitely want this to appear there somewhere. Um, but it's it's good to know that you know it's under discussion and you know the status. Yep. Yeah. So. Um, member Peck, I, I, in terms of uh, the the sign ordinance, the way it was written, I actually I I appreciated it. I I, I hated the day the political signs go up, and I was out there putting them up, and then they would be all over the place. And I really welcomed the day when they all came down because it was like the norm that that our neighborhoods came back to normal and and then this supreme court ruling happened where we couldn't regulate any of that and so now we're in this new zone of how do we you know so our old ordinances just don't apply anymore and um and that the and if i have it right uh, attorney seawall the only place this really applies that we have control is over public property not on private property incorrect we can regulate signs on public private property, but we can only regulate them, for instance, how far from the from the property line, how far from the sidewalk, how how many, um, you know, how large, uh, you know, what size is the limit? Uh, are lighted signs okay? Are light signs that and this isn't as crucial in the residential areas, but signs that change, um, those are safety concerns. Um, extra large signs are safety concerns. Number of signs can be an aesthetic concern, but it doesn't matter what it says on the sign. That's the point. I can't tell you and, how and much s- I learned whenever I'm incorrect with you. Thank you. <laughs> and and um, so right now we have no sign ordinance essentially. Right. Um, and you know, these, these judgment calls are very difficult because you know, on the one hand, we don't want all the clutter. On the other hand, we want people to be able to express themselves. So it's a, these are hard lines to draw. And I think that's part of the reason that it keeps appearing on and, and falling off our, our radar screen. So we had a draft for two signs at some point, right? I believe we did. That was an early draft from Carol and Mish. Um, but I don't think Carolyn at the time fully understood what the, uh, the you know, the, town of Gilbert case stood for. Um, Any other comments? Are you all set, Councilor Nash? I'm all done. Uh, Uh, Councilor Labarge. Yes, um, I know definitely when it comes to campaigning that chairs on the campaigns and stuff, if they saw signs attorney Seawall that were on city property versus being on private property, they would go and remove them. Is that still the same now? Yes, we have the right to control signs on public property because it's our property, but we're talking about signs on private property. 
Okay. And a lot of people don't realize that tree belts are public property. And so they get removed from tree belts as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Yep, I do. Jeff? Yeah, just uh, I, I know that we had uh, talked about at least conceptually the fact that, you know, we might not um, pass along wholly formed ordinances to the city council when we're done, but we also uh, had discussed, um, you know, maybe just ideas or suggestions or whatever. And I would just say that, um, recommend that this go into the thing. I mean, this is, I think is really uncontroversial. We have to do this. This is an uncontroversial un un thing that has to be done. Um, and the city council would likely take it up even if we didn't include it in the suggestions or the recommended things that we um, pass along to them. But I think that we should formally put this in the the basket of things that we're going to hand off to them as as recommendations. I don't, we haven't discussed exactly what that mechanism is, mechanism is going to look like, but. I guess maybe now at the time. That was on my list of things to discuss too. Are you, I mean, are, are you talking about like the organization of the content of the report that we're producing or? Uh, I was just thinking that like, it, it, there, were, there are things that we will clearly um, be passing along to the city council as a result of all of our work that is, you know, um, changes to existing ordinances, um, suggested new or ordinances mm -hmm. in, in writing. And then also there, I think this fits into the category of like, well, we may not have a fully formed ordinance, but this mm -hmm. is conceptually what we would recommend that the city council take up. Yeah. Recommendations aren't off the table there, uh, Jeff. So. They're, they are off the table or they aren't? They're not off the table. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. So should we keep a running list of this? of these um, that have been um, passed back to us from Attorney Seawald. Um, so that we've discussed and do we need to vote on whether, oh, sorry. No, you keep going. To, you can, oh, Laura has her hand raised. I think she. Oh, I can't see her either, so Laura. I'd be happy to set up a list of items to be included in the report if it would be helpful so we don't forget. Yeah. Yes, yep. thank you. Excellent. <clears throat> and she has been keeping a list of the ones that I've reviewed. So yeah. that's that's ongoing. Yep. Right. Should we consider this um, signed ordinance reviewed by you then, Attorney Seawald? Or should we still refer it to you? Or since you- The, the problem with, with things like the sign ordinance is I don't have anything to review. We certainly can, and I can tell you right now that we can regulate signs and, you know, you know, in accordance with the Supreme Court case. Um, but I don't have anything, un unless you're going to make recommendations such as, you know, no more than three signs per property. They may, they need to be more than 10 feet from the property line. You know, that's, unless you're going to make recommendations like that, I will review them. But just a recommendation that the city council take up a sign ordinance, consider it reviewed. And so I would actually make the motion that this uh, suggestion of reviewing uh, a sign ordinance based upon the Supreme Court's decision be included in our recommendations to the city council. Okay. And so, Laura, this would go on the list. Sure. Thank you. It was that. That, that, that was a motion. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll second that. Well, motion made by Jeff, seconded by Jim, Councilor Nash. And Laura, we're going to put that on the list now. Right. Should I do a roll call or is there? Yes. Okay. Um, Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Moving on, we have next is the commercial buffer zone proposal. Now we were supposed to hear from um, Councillor Alex Jarrett this evening, but he's not able to join us. 
do we wish to have a discussion on this matter? Should we table this to the time when he can be with uh, here with us? I'd like to hear from some of the members. Well, he had emailed me that he would like to attend the next our next uh, meeting, and so um, I would like to hear from him then. Mm -hmm. I'll second that motion. Okay. So that will be tabled for the next meeting. Councilor Nash. Councilor Nash. Oh, I just, I was afraid we we're gonna go and vote. And I think that the the chair has the, um, the okay to go and table something of his own accord. And, um, and I would agree with that. Yeah, tabling it till Councilor Jared is here next time to speak to it. And I, I, I'm looking forward to talk to a, a, about it because I, I did a little more research myself. And I have plenty of um, waste trucks showing up at constituents near constituents' houses and banging at all hours. So we have plenty to talk about. Okay, yeah, so I am, yes, as chair, I'm tabling that for the um, next meeting. Thank you. Up next is the proposal for expanded zoning map change notification requirement. Proposal for expanded notification under 350-3.5. Now open for discussion. Councilor Nash. Yeah, I'd like to speak to this because it um, it's a proposal that Councilor Sharon and I are both working on uh, that it, it's it's come out of uh, a number of of uh, map changes that we've worked on as counselors over the last few years, and that um, that the, the the current practice is whenever there's a map change um, for zoning um, that the 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 parties being the the properties being affected directly by the map change. So where the new overlay is happening, they're the ones who are notified, but the immediate abutters are not notified. And, and furthermore, the, the residents living within the structures within the new overlay, they are not notified. And also the, the people who um, reside or rent the, in, the, in the abutting zone are not notified either. And, and on council, what we've seen is um, we've heard a lot from uh, the, the abutters over the years. So it, uh, most recently, back in the spring when we did some rezoning on Con Street, we heard we, we had another, we had, there were, there's always some abutters who show up and say, I didn't know about this. I'm finding about this, find out about this just this morning. And, uh, and I can't believe that nobody ever notified me. And, and in fairness, I, I, I think that's, that's, that's a reasonable complaint because what we're allowing with a map change is for uh, a, a neighbor to be able to do different things. And I think it's important for that person on the other side of the fence to know what that is and that, um, and that they be invited into the room for that discussion. But also, you know, we're now in the time of COVID and we're also exploring ways to uh, bring, take a more inclusive approach to getting everybody at the table um, that it's time to also open it up to consider the folks who actually reside within, within the, the, the map overlay area and the abutters as well so that they can also weigh in and that, um, that I know that for the planning department, because I've had some back and forth with them in the mayor's office and Councillor Sher today, this all gets very complicated. But at the same time, I, I think it's time for us to have this discussion about how to be more inclusive and, and how to get more people to the table. And, and we all know that you know people who own property are going to tend to be the people who are less marginalized and the people who are renting or residing in, 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 in buildings are going to be it, just an overall trend towards being more marginalized. And this would be a way to 
you know, around us achieving our goal and, and, and also in, in, you know, just overall inviting more people to the table. And, and, um, um, and Councillor Thorpe will remember this. I barely remember it because I had COVID at the time, but that um, during discussions around that, um, that map change on Con Street, there was a number of residents who got word and were at that meeting. And what was interesting is there were abutters who were against the map change. They, they were like, they were questioned it a lot. And what was interesting, it was the residents who lived like a block away who were like, oh, we think this is great. With, there'll be more opportunity for this type of, you know, uh, of commerce to go on, or it supports the current commerce that's going on there. It had to do with the World War II Club at the time. Um, and they really supported all of the, the activities that they were that were going on there that were, weren't allowed under the current zoning. So they were uh, very supportive of the change, which kind of flipped things around. It was like, well, that's an interesting thing. And um, the, the last thing I wanna say here is if we, and, and, and I'm well aware of the ask that we're doing here, that um, it, it's a big ask to once you start getting into renters, the people who rent, you're really, it's, it's an exponential increase in the number of mailings that need to occur for the planning department when they do this. For example, everybody in Salvo House would have needed to get some sort of postcard. And, um, and in fairness, everybody in Salvo House should have gotten a you know, needed notification the only thing I was able to do at that time was to get into the building and, and put a, um, a, a notice on their bulletin board because I, as a counselor, don't have, I don't have a way to mail to everybody and I only have so many email addresses. So um, anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's my opening. And, and I want to hit, my, my thought is that I'd like to see um, us refer this to the planning board to get their input and to work with the planning department on coming up with some recommendations in um, uh, around this. I'm imagining there, that there's probably going to, to be, um, it's, uh, that um, it's complicated. And so we're gonna hear different ideas as this moves forward. And um, so that's my summary. Thank you, Councillor Nash, and greatly appreciate it to having heard from you. Um, any other comments? Councillor uh, so, Large? Yes. Um, I would like to um, talk with Attorney Seawald, please. Councillor Nash, in regards to Walter Savos, are you talking about the World War II Club when that was up for sale and right. they're not being notified? Correct. Well, no, it, it's not that it was up for sale. It was up for being rezoned. And we were discussing it during a time when it was up for sale. But there was properties all along Con Street, of which the World War II Club was one of them, yeah. that there was properties directly across the street, I think directly across the street from, yes, directly across the street from Salvo House, that were up for consideration. And Salvo House would, under you know, the way we define a butter would fall on, it would be an abutting property. And, and if we open the door up on notifying residents, we would be telling, informing those residents in Salvo House. And there's a, very many people there, so. So, Attorney Seawald, with the Mass General Laws, okay, whoever owns a building, they're selling it, it's their responsibility to send letters to the abutters at what three hundred feet, right? Who does that? No, 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 no. You're, you're, Councilor, you're, you're confusing several different things. Yeah. The sale of a building requires no notice to anybody. That's private commerce. Somebody can sell their building. The reason that there was an issue down at World War II Club be, is because the sale was contingent on the change in zoning, so I that the buyer that. at the at the time could do what the buyer wanted to do. Um, but that is not a function of the sale. Anytime a map change is taking place, 
is our ordinances require that the owner get a notice. And, you know, Councillor Nash has uh, pointed out a very simple uh, example, but I want the committee to think about if, for instance, hypothetically, if we were to decide to merge uh, urban A, B, and C zones into one urban zone, Everyone in the A, B, and C zone would have to get a notice. Everyone within 300, everyone abutting the A, you know, those zones would have to get notice. Everyone abutting the abutter within 300 feet would need to get notice. And the residents of all of those, every resident, non-owner resident of A, B, and C would need to get notice. And every resident of abutters would need to get notice and abutters to abutters would need to get notice. That's thousands of notices potentially. And so, you know, we have eliminated zones and those are map changes. So we have to be very careful. It's very simple when you're changing, you know, three properties from, you know, you know, to the central business from, you know, a different kind of business. That's simple. There were probably maybe 20 people who needed to be, or maybe a hundred people uh, considering the Salvo house. But you're talking about many, many thousands of people potentially needing to get notice. Okay. And and the other thing I would also point out, counts to, to the committee, is that as we were discussing before, we don't unlike ownership, which you can go down to the registry of deeds and see the current ownership on any given day. We have no way of knowing who's living in all these buildings, and we do have the street list. But that's a snapshot in time, and those things change. Not only is not everybody on that the the that list, I would hypothesize that uh, many of the people are the underserved and marginalized people who don't end up on the city list. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I'm I, this is need, this is something that you really need to balance. I let me the last thing I will say is state law does not require notice to owners, to abutters, to abutters, to abutters, or any residents. It's just publication notice is all you need for any zone change, publication. We have expanded that to owners. And so we don't even have to do the owners. And now we're going so, f I, I mean, I, I, I understand the desire, but the potential, you know, burden is huge. Right. I'll leave Attorney C. Walt, well, what happened? I'm here. I think I lost Attorney C. Walt. Oh, there you are. Um, Attorney C. Walt, I know like when we applied for um, to have a building lot and our attorneys did all the work of mailing out to all the abutters at the 300 feet, whatever, and we went to planning and everything up because that had to be done and all that. So I'm hearing about the zoning part that you're talking about. And I have to agree with you. You're looking at a tremendous amount of people here. And how would you find these records? Because people come and go. The only way that you could really do this, I think, is to go to, and I'm going to bite my tongue as I say this, is to go to rental registration as Amherst has done, which is monumental. Uh, believe me, I lived through it. I was practicing in Amherst at the time, and uh, it was an enormous undertaking. Um, but other than that, uh, I don't know how we would notice, and you know, residents who don't get noticed, would they have the right to appeal? Would tenants have the right to appeal if they didn't get notice? I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, attorney, Steve, are, are you saying that? Uh, so, if we if we um, codify this in in ordinance, that the that if we did not adequately contact somebody with a postcard, we risk what? I mean, the rezoning undone and redone. Okay, because one person wasn't notified. Correct. You're, you're raising them to the status of someone who is entitled to due process. 
See, under the state law, no one is entitled to due process on his own change. So, um, you know, now you have elevated owners. We have already elevated owners to uh, parties who are entitled to due process, but you, you can't provide the right to due process, not provide the process and then say, oh, well, somebody's rights have been violated. You're creating rights. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if there were an, an executive order to much the same effect, would it, um, it, would it carry the same weight as an ordinance? No. Oh. And uh, for instance, um, right now the planning department requires that you know, those little orange signs be put out um, and, uh, right. by, the, by the applicant. And I think they're finding that those are the, you know, most likely to inform people. I mean, the newspaper publication, I mean, that's a relic of that, you know, that should be in the dustbin of history because there's no one is reading the, the, uh, the legal notices except for me. And, uh, and that's because I have not, I must be a boring person because I scan the legal notices. Most people don't, and most people don't get informed by the legal notices. But if you put a, an orange sign out in front of the house across the street, that's where people get informed. But at the same time, having to put orange signs on every property that's going to be rezoned, that's, it's huge. It can be huge, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, and, and so to, to, to counter that, it's, it's really, in my view, it's the map changes that are the most important. I mean, we do a good job at notifying people around a special permit and site plan. We use the, the signs, uh, uh, abutters and property owners get, um, uh, get mailed notices and that, but the thing is that the zoning's already cooked at that point, that what people are attending a meeting for is to make making sure that the law as it's written is carried out in the way that it's it's stated in in our ordinance whereas with a map changer you that's the opportunity where you're talking about hey we're shifting the law around and that's that's really the meeting that everybody needs to be at that's that's the one where you go oh hey wait a minute they're going to be able to park more cars there oh the building can be that tall and, and so that's, that's my, my reasoning for, I mean, because I, I've been, because you know this attorney C. Well, I've sat through too many planning board meetings where constituents are just like feeling like, why, why didn't I know this was gonna happen, you know, before this meeting, if I'd known that everything was a done deal, they like to say, well, it, in some ways it is because that's, that's what the law is. The law is about, it's outlining how things are gonna happen for a particular, particular development. But these, this is, map change is the big opportunity to really talk about what the change is gonna look like. And um, so um, anyway, I, I would like to refer this to the planning board and, and let them uh, kick it around with the planning department and see what they can come up with. Um, I. In some of my emails today, I heard some of the concerns uh, expressed by attorney Seawald here. And I think it's good that we vet this out. Um, and that I, I will say that um, um, in, in the case of, and I'm, I'll throw Hildegard Friedman out there, who is not on the internet. And that, um, that one of the ways that she, I don't know if she's in 300 feet of that rezoning, but she's very close to it. And if she had received a postcard, she would have definitely been part of that meeting. I don't think she was. And that, um, that that's the sort of citizen that we wanna be thinking about how we're gonna reach out to. We're talking about people who don't even have the internet. Um, as many people in um, Salvo House and other apartments like that are. So um, the mail and the telephone are the way a lot of those people have contact with the world and i'm talking dial-up telephone so anyway i'd like to i i'd like this to be uh i'd like to make a motion to to refer this over to the planning board to get further input i'll second that motion 
Okay, motion made could, by could, Councillor Nash, seconded could, by Councillor Bard. And could, could, I'd like to hear from Attorney Seawald and then uh, Jeff Napolitano. Might, might we sub send this to the planning board and request their review and comment? I'm not sure that you have the, the authority to refer and require anybody to do anything. Thank you. I'll, I'd yeah. like to amend it to, how did you say it, Attorney Seawald? <laughs> Convey it to the planning board and re request their review. Exactly. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> well, we're going to vacate what you said. Right, for, for review. Mm -hmm. For comment and review. Review and okay. comment. I, before we do that, though, I, I definitely I saw Jeff Napolitano's hand up, so I'd like to hear from him. No, I just, uh, and, and this is, this goes towards this conversation, but it also informs the whole conversation about housing. Do we have demographic information about the distinction between owner homeowners in Northampton and uh, renters or non-homeowners, -home I suppose? Uh, and I'm thinking particularly about uh, 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 racial demographics, but also, I mean, anything. I mean, uh, given that we're tasked with, you know, considering the effects that uh, upon different people, it would be useful to, to understand exactly <clears throat> who is being impacted. And planning might have some of those statistics. I can't think of anybody else who would, unless Pl Pioneer Vale, uh, BVPC might have some of those kinds of statistics also. Yeah, I, I just want to add uh, in a back and forth with Wayne uh, this afternoon. Yeah, he, he was referring to all sorts of data that the planning department has and the shortcomings of it as well, that, um, that the planning department has reasonably accurate information about, I would say about 85% of the citizens, people living here, residents, uh, but there's there's a number of people that just are, they're flying under the radar. And that part of it has to do with their renting and some of it has to do with they don't wanna be on the radar. And that um, that uh, that is, and, and as attorney Seawald saying, you're opening up the door to being culpable for, you know, making sure those people all of those people that you don't know about know about this meeting, this hearing, and that, um, and I understand that, but um, I, I think that we need to have this discussion and, and figure out how we, how we can do this because I, I, I think there's risks here. I think there's we're already taking risk letting property owners know, and um, we we've so I think it's time to go full board. So anyway, um, Any, all right, so I think we have a motion on the floor. Um, your amended motion. Is yeah, my amended floor. motion. Okay. Any other comments before we vote on the amended motion going forward to the planning department, the planning board? Seeing none, Laura? Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano. Yes. Okay. Moving now down to items pending. Um, we still have to review the false alarms and other related ordinances. And I put this on just for a further discussion before we bring this forward um, to see who we might want to have come and talk about this. Um, I know um, Vice Chair Peck wanted to have this addressed and, um, you know, I was thinking someone from the fire department um, at some point coming down and talking about the alarms and I would like to hear from some members about this as well. So it's now open for discussion. Council uh, uh, Labarge. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that's a great idea if we could get somebody from the fire department to come in and talk about fire alarms, because I do know, um, even in Ward 6 and in the city, I have friends also who have alarm systems, and sometimes they go off when they shouldn't be going off, if it's windy or whatever, and the first time you don't get fined, but after that you get fined, so... I would like to have them come in if you could possibly get them to come to this meeting and talk about 
the fines and the alarm systems. Okay. Are the do they do the enforcement? They do, right? Pardon? The, the fire department enforces this this ordinance, I believe. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Council Thorpe, is that accurate? The I was just gonna say the ordinance, the one sixteen one has to do with an intrusion alarms, which would be enforced by the police department, police. not the false the um, smoke detector, false you know fire alarm activations is a different section of the code. That's <laughs> by the fire department though. If we wanted to talk specifically about the change to the one sixteen one, that is where we're deciding whether to recommend going down. Uh, having three alarms versus one alarm before you start charging. That's the PD. I would like to hear from them. I think in the, also, <laughs> I think in the November 2nd meeting, I brought up that the related, um, the related ordinances as well, because um, just because there was something that struck me as being maybe um, overly punitive mm -hmm. to people. Um, like the fire chief shall notify the alarm user by certified mail of such fact, you know, let's see. After they've recorded three separate false alarms within any 12 month period um, and said user is required to submit within 15 days after receipt of such notice certification indicating that the problem had been identified and corrected. Um, so that's where I feel like a lot of people are kind of falling short. It just um, not being able to to comply with that, and then incurring. Do you have an alarm system, Megan? Do do, do I have yeah. an alarm system? Yeah, I'll say everybody does. Yes, um, you need them, Jenna. So I'm certainly I'm I'm certain I have um, triggered it falsely yeah. before, um, but I haven't been. But I but I um, because I'm <laughs> I'm fully in control of my system. I was able to call in and cancel the um, notification to the police department, and I don't think a lot of people. I mean, they may not be aware that this is happening. And so, I don't know, this is just, you know, an example of, ex example of many, many ordinances that are affecting people who are what we, who we consider marginalized. And I'm just guessing here, that means people who are um, more, you know, BIPOC, you know, low income, disabled, um, who are, you know, not, you know, able to participate um, civically the way that we do. Um, and so, um, yeah, this is why I, you know, wanted to flag this for further discussion. And, you know, eventually in the report, we're going to have um, these different buckets that we've talked about, but also group the, uh, you know, a lot of these ordinances that are discussed into these categories like zoning and um, housing that have historically, you know, been used um, as weapons of exclusion and so forth. So we, um, so, you know, we're not going to be able to, come, we're not going to be able to um, tackle most of the, even a small fraction of the ordinances that exist now. But I just think this is, um, since it's come to our attention, we can use it as like a, you know, a representative of a category of ordinances that we're in that that require more attention from our policymakers. Thank you, Megan. Any other comments? I can't. Jeff, I don't see you, but would you like to make a comment? Nope, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Nash. I'm good. Let's in, invite the fire chief. So that will we will um, we will do that for, for a um, future meeting, and that's that's good. So um, that 
is our last item. And the only item left is did you want to invite the fire chief for the next meeting or is that just a nope, future not meeting? yet not yet gotcha. we're gonna mm -hmm. <laughs> well hopefully councillor jarrett will be attending yeah. the next one exactly that's and what i wanted to, to provide context on all the the number and there's there are a number of ordinances that he's submitted to us mm -hmm. uh, for discussion for review so um Well, a, a question I have is, that, is he going to want to speak to more than just the one that he's then the buffer zone? Um, if so, he he's also had the, let us um, know so we can put that on the agenda. He had the sign ordinance as well that he um, has suggested along with the, yes, the, the buffer zone. Other than that, I don't know of many more that he has suggested to the committee. All right. So, other than that, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Laura, roll call, please. Sure. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano. Yes. Okay. Good night, everyone. Motions adjourned. We are all set. Everyone have a good night and thank you. Bye.